So I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of a company that I joined a year ago, but most of the story comes from the time that was prior to Guard Time when I was Under Secretary of E-Services and Innovation at the Ministry of Social Affairs in Estonia, basically responsible and overseeing the implementation of this uh, blockchain technology. So I'm going to give a little bit of a context. When people tell that in healthcare Estonia is very digitized, it wouldn't be possible if we hadn't the overall uh, Estonian um, uh, society really embedded with digitization. So you saw these nice web plans, since we have 1.3 million people uh, living approximately on the, on the size of a country like uh, the Netherlands or, or Denmark. So we like space around us, but at the same time we also like 4G connection uh, you know, when there is like n nobody around us in the vicinity of the next 10 kilometers. So um, it, it is really pervasive. So, uh, and that did start before the blockchain era. Also, it is important that it's not only public sector or, or, or this is not only companies. This is, again, another example of how the whole society has done something together and they like it. And that kind of gives also the resilience of keep innovating all the time. Now, and within this context, yes, healthcare is also digitized. And, uh, well, I told there's 1.3 million people, not that much. But in a month, 2.3 million queries have been done by doctors. And uh, there will be a few kind of reflections. But the whole premise is that since the very beginning, the, 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 the core purpose of digitalization of country, and including that also healthcare, has been integration. So we've heard here several times that you know, integration, we need to do this in healthcare, and this is a problem. For us, it's the other way around. And then also you're going to see why the way we have implemented blockchain might be not kind of directly applicable, but at least from the technological point of view, but also conceptually, I think it would help also something practical to be done here. Now, the, the other thing is that Estonia is a relatively poor country. Uh, when we started digitalization, um, I think our uh, uh, we were um, uh, the... Uh, out of the 25 EU member states, um, we were from the bottom, either the last one or the second last one in our GDP per capita. So efficiency in using digital tools uh, or uh, actually excuse of using digital tools, again, has been an important thing. So we don't spend much on healthcare. At the same time, if you look on the, on the upper side, this is really just, just to give kind of visual image at least we are on average in providing healthcare to people. So we spend you know, less than uh, most of the uh, developed countries, but we can, with that limited amount of money, achieve quite a good results. And you can also see that the administrative costs, so the costs that our insurance, we do have social insurance model pretty much like the Germany, uh, uh, which, means that, uh, which means that it's paid by employers uh, through payroll taxes, but it is mandatory. And, and also the governance agency is uh, uh, not directly responsible to the government but to the parliament, so it's, it's a quasi public entity. It's independent from politics, but it manages its funds um, as, a, as, as a public entity. And you see that the administrative costs are going down and down and down, and this is because we do things digitally. So that is what has been the premise from the start. And to summarize all that, there are a few things you can't do digitally in Estonia. You can't marry, you can't divorce, you can't sell your real estate. Those are considered the higher risk activities. You know, when somebody from the state needs to stand, be uh, stand beside you and look into your eye and say, is this really the thing you, that you want to do? Everything else you can do digitally. And digitally means I can do it from here, from Boston. I can vote from here. I can sell my old car from here. I can you know, look how my kid is doing at school. And, and I can open okay, my, my gates or, or, or sign all the documents uh, as I'm uh, um, general manager of the company, sign contracts, so everything you can do digital. Now, where did it start from? It started 
roughly around 2000 then we had a prime minister who was uh, a, a really visionary but he was also a stubborn guy he said I want my government entities to talk to each other uh, and people started to say well it's complicated it may be costly well, well bring bring me some people tell me how this can do and then there were multinational companies coming to Estonia um, some of them from US from Germany and others and they presented at that time you know, what solutions they had and projected the cost of ownership for the next 10 years. And the main problem with all of them was that they all had two zeros too much in the end of the price tag. The country couldn't afford that. So it turned to its own engineers. And so you can see the timeline here. You know, it started with reporting taxes. 15 minutes, all the taxes are filed, they're pre-populated. You get rebate from the government within uh, five working days. So very nice, convenient services. Then the private sector provided M parking. You don't need to carry coins wherever, wherever you go. And the, all the other things. And in 2002, I think most of the, the digital infrastructure was laid down. We had digital identity. Uh, we had uh, security or secure transport layer. I'm going to come back to that in a second. And then other, other services, ID bus ticket that is provided by the uh, private sector using the same infrastructure the public sector provided. 2007 and forward, uh, mobile ID, so in, in addition to ID card, now we have, we, and I mostly use my mobile ID to identify myself, e-prescription in 2010, e-health system 2008, all cool, nice things. And now, now pay attention, in, something happened in 2007. And if I go back to the previous slide, all these things, at least from the user point of view, were gone for two or three days. Couldn't use them. They had to close it down. We had a uh, state-sponsored DDoS attack. And then government and actually people started to think as well, well, we are now in trouble. So what, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with our uh, society? And uh, the, 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 the idea was that not to abandon what had been created, but actually, if everything you know about your people, who owns what land, who's married to whom, what is more health record, you know, who owns who, how much somebody is digital, and somebody presents your data, how do you know this is truthful? And so the challenge was put to engineers, build us a machine which is capable of proving Time, integrity, and the, and the origin of any data, regardless of also any trust, centralized trust authority, which means the government. Government asked engineers, build us a machine that can actually verify the data without us. Because we know governments, well, we sometimes we like them, or we you know, split half and half, but nevertheless, we, we have to engage with them but the system needs to be independent from the government. So there are two things that, and, and the next slide you're going to see the solution which is built in blockchain. But there is, this is very important. What was the problem? So in 2007, nobody knew what blockchain is. Nobody was using the term. So that it didn't start from the tech, it started from the problem. First features of this problem. It is very specific about the immutability, and there is no anonymity ask. And, and the third bit is it has to scale. It has to scale across the government, across all the, its uh, uh, departments, and also it has to scale across the private sector. So those things were there from the very beginning. And so this you know, came as a solution, elegant one. Maybe some say it's too simple. You take any data assets, you calculate one-way cryptographic hash, a fingerprint which is preserving my privacy because the fingerprint tells I was here, but you cannot calculate back my other features from that fingerprint. You record that fingerprint on a blockchain, distributed network, give back owner of that data asset a receipt, validating the time, uh, the entity, and, and that this, this document hasn't been uh, changed. And now any time this owner uh, shows this data asset to any other counterpart. The receiver can independently verify the authenticity. And that's it. That's what you use blockchain in Estonia and you use it at scale. So 
And the data asset can be doctor's report, MRI scan, it can be full genome sequencing, it can be just a log, so any size of the data, which is also very important in healthcare. So many other blockchain solutions have the problem for the scalability because there is just too much information. Yes, there are different hybrid solutions, and I'm gonna co come back to that, that we are using also uh, uh, the uh, um, um, public and uh, permissionless blockchain for smart contracts. But remember the original ask by the government wasn't to build us a smart contract system. It was to build us something that helps to protect the immutability. So another thing is that you scale it up and then the, the, most, the, the, really the, the most wonderful thing is that what is a trust anchor? Trust anchor is a newspaper. Widely witnessed evidence, something that Galileo Galilei a few, uh, uh, um, several years ago, used in order to verify that he was the author of one of his in inventions. So he used the same kind of hash published in the newspaper, and later on nobody could claim that he wasn't uh, the author of that. Or uh, actually, nobody else could claim that they were the author. So uh, the root hash every month is published in uh, Financial Times and LinkedIn and Twitter and a few other papers. And what does that give? It, it gives us quantum immunity because it doesn't matter how much computation power you have. In order to change the trust anchor, you would need to collect all the Financial Times globally, uh, roughly 250,000 uh, uh, copies from all the libraries, change the hash from there, put them back in the Rollinger places, and then you can prove this was something different. So we believe this is pretty much um, a, a, a reliable solution that once you have your data asset which is signed with that document and you trust the mathematics, and this is e in EU ADAS accredited uh, uh, service, uh, and it is basically even out of our uh, uh, control for, for, for being distributed, that this is this independent trust layer. That enables you to, to do following things. So this is, this is what has been uh, provided, and our approach in Estonia, and also now when I'm working at Gartan, is that, and we heard that, I, I, I really have enjoyed all those uh, uh, previous sessions. Everything is a process. So the most secure way uh, to keep your data is buried deep down underground and make certain that nobody ever sees that not very useful. So actually, in order to make the data useful, you need to start you know, moving it around or making, uh, giving access to it or building some sort of processes which happen over time. And then you, you need, the trust comes from the fact that you know that you know, if you are down the stream, that what has been presented to you is trustworthy, but also that if your data is being floating around somewhere, you know what is actually happening with that. Uh, and so we built uh, um, uh, blockchain-backed e-health registry. No, our data is not on blockchain. It still resides where it is. But what we do have is that the final medical records all are immu immutably signed, and all the logs which are happening, both internal, 30% of data breaches are due to either deliberate or just mismanagement, internal threat, or, or outside. Doctor adds something, or another doctor accesses the file from another one. And this information is made available to every citizen. This logging, which means that if any doctor looks at my file, I know that immediately. And there are also automated services on top of that which enable uh, to understand me if something, something odd is happening. So again, the cost part of the blockchain which gives this, this uh, uh, trust uh, is, is very low because again, a big part of other security problems are still solved in the old way. In a nutshell, the system enables uh, technical, uh, please bear with me, this is the technical assumption that any data for any professional at any place is available at any time. This is not the case in real life. You use um, different security measures, you use different rules, and you use blockchain to, to verify that only the things that are allowed to happen for those individuals 
who are authorized to do so are actually happening. But uh, this is a circle, and, and, and really, I, I think uh, the, the slides will be made available to you. And the whole idea is that actually now we are starting to kind of rebuilding those services uh, 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 in, a, in a renewed way. And um, um, uh, won't spend too much time on this, but I just hope you to take me for my word that how we balance this um, accessibility is using the transparency because we believe that the data about <coughs> myself, I at least should have some control over it. Yes, there are, let's say, um, possibilities whereby the default condition in healthcare is that my files from a hospital are made available uh, to the GP or family doctor next, next day, but I can opt out. So I can close that from happening, and when I see the doctor in the office, again, opening that file to, to, this, office, uh, to this doctor at his office is made very simple so that you balance the technical capability of connecting everything with, with everything, but also you build the, the, the service layer on top of that, controlled, monitored, with every second frequency using blockchain. What's the value? Extremely rapid scale-up. So we started with digital prescriptions a few years later than Danes or Catalonia in Europe. In Denmark, it took four years to get to 80%. In Estonia, it was nine months. Actually, it was a surprise for, uh, for us as well. The, the, the systems that were capable, that, that were built to, to process those digital prescriptions, they had to, um, th there were a few logical mistakes in the data architecture, so it was stalled for two weeks because it couldn't actually serve as many ser uh, people uh, uh, initially. It, it was kind of intended for a much, much longer uh, uh, scale-up. Uh, second, uh, you do get uh, efficiency from that. Again, this was built by the government, so the reasoning behind that was also government-led, and if you read, if you read the, the last bullet point, you can see that the idea was to use that data and actually enable uh, uh, people to use more generic drugs as compared to branded drugs, and it actually was achieved in a relatively short period because the digital prescription but also some uh, uh, clinical uh, decision support systems were combined together. So you can start building various things, and, and this slide, I've, uh, I should add uh, the, uh, the recent version because the 2018 numbers, actually the, the red one is important, that we didn't start building these digital services when everybody you know, loved them. The, the trust level of our genetic data to be combined with healthcare data was about 18%, 180. But it doesn't prevent you from starting. And if you're managing your services in a, in a way that you give back to people a little bit of those nice services that are, as I mentioned, with the tax authority or, or in healthcare, also digital prescription, the trust grows over time. You cannot create it from void. But this is necessary, and also we're using blockchain to keep and maintain the trust not to go, to go away. Uh, so, again, I'm, I'm starting to summarize. My time is over, I believe, in, okay, one and nine seconds. <laughs> so you build it in a stacked way. So if needed, there is also a security server ordered by Department of Defense of US government, which, by the way, is the largest uh, uh, customer of Gartam. So Gartam did not start from healthcare. We started first from defense and, and, and telecom. Uh, and then you build services like Provenance Trail. You build consent on that. We heard a few examples. And then we also have done uh, integrations with uh, distributed ledgers, which are um, uh, permissionless uh, and, uh, and public which means that the smart contracting bit, you know what data comes there or where the data comes from. If you have different DLTs that need to be combined with each other, you can easily do that. So that you don't constrain yourself with heavy engineering, you know, setting up 500 nodes for a pharma supply chain. I think there are very few technologies which are capable of doing that. But if you start you know, from the right order, this is, this is the, the possibilities. And, um, uh, uh, also, if you combine now blockchain with other cryptographic te technologies, 
what you get is that you can differentiate between what we call data liquidity, that is when the data actually with PII moves from one place to another, to data visibility, when you, when you allow only access. So machines do, I don't know, multi-party computation or zero knowledge proof or whatever, and they present the end result for, for instance, outcome-based contracting, insurance and uh, provider and uh, uh, pharma company, they all basically see the same result without compromising the privacy of individuals because that data was never shown to all the others. But at the same time, if pharma and insurance are about to agree in payments of hundreds of millions or billions, they need to be certain that this, this data, which the computation is based upon, is trustworthy. So, um, these are the projects that the government can implement now because we have this infrastructure. So, and uh, this is kind of my way of uh, articulating that. This is, this is the, the, the future of healthcare that I can see making. Pockets of excellence in many other countries. Currently also, you know, Gartime is working also in this country, but we're working very closely with Nordic countries, NHS in England and, uh, and Spain. So it is possible, I can, I, can, I can certainly assure you. And I'm gonna finish with uh, three statements. Start with a problem, and then you find the right combination of technology. Uh, in our case, it was really the integrity that we use. We don't use it for transport, we don't use it for confidentiality. Yes, in our research labs, there are people who are talking about you know, blockchain-backed quantum immune uh, identity management as well. But you do not need to start from there to start reaping the benefits of blockchain. And my final slide comes from this very town. I was enlightened myself and of our thinking and the way how John Lamka put it, what you can do and what is meaningful to use blockchain, I think you should read the journal. It seems that it, it spreads uh, 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 reasonable uh, thinking. So thank you once again. The 2019 Converge to Accelerate conference is brought to you by IEEE, the world's largest technical professional organization for the advancement of technology. Bollinger Ingelheim, passionately working to improve healthcare. NASCO, advancing digital health together. IPSI US, the association of independent workers, for one, for all. Partners in digital health, publishers of the forward-reaching blockchain in healthcare today and telehealth and medicine today. Special consideration to iWorker Innovation.